Well, um, we're going to start another session on our, our children's catechism. And children, today we are learning about the most wonderful thing that we could possibly learn about because it's not a thing, it's a person. We're learning about God and the way that we should uh, live before Him, the attitude that should be in our heart, uh, thinking about Him all the time. Um, our question, again, we're, we're still on the same question and the same answer because it's a, it's a big question. Um, what is the chief end of man? Remember what that means. What, why were you made? Why did God make you? Uh, why do you exist? And the answer is, the chief end of man, or you exist, to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's why you're here. And that's what we want for you. And that's why we're teaching this today. Now, what have we learned? Well, we learned what the chief end is, haven't we? That it, it, it's the reason why you are alive and the reason why God made you. And then yesterday, or the last session, we, uh, we said, what does it mean to glorify God? And we, um, we said that the answer uh, really required two answers. So let's look at the first one. Um, the first is, to glorify God means to recognize that He is greater and more valuable and more beautiful than all other things combined, and that we will only find life and peace and satisfaction in Him. So, in order to glorify God, first of all, you must know who He is. Now, children, listen to me. Um, you're a lot smarter uh, than, than most people think. If you're even five and six and seven years old, um, you can know many great and deep and wide and profound things about God. Um, you can know the Scriptures. As a matter of fact, children, some of you may be at the age where you're just now learning to read. Do you know why you should learn to read? It's not so that just one day you can get a job. Um, you learn to read so that you can read God's Word and so that you can know Him. And even though you're little, you can know a lot about God. And you need to ask your mom and your dad and uh, the, the leaders in your church to teach you the great and wonderful things about God because you can learn them. You say, Brother Paul, what must I do to learn them? You seek God. Even if you can't read, I want you to get on your knees, uh, maybe beside your bed and say, God, I want to know you. I want to know who you are. I want to know about all these marvelous things that Brother Paul's telling me about. I mean... Can you really be that great God? Please show me. And I can tell you something, uh, children. He is not only that great. He's greater than, than great. Now, so we, we looked at all the, well, several of the most marvelous things about God. How beautiful He is. How wise He is. How powerful He is. Um, now we're going to look at the second part of this question. What does it mean to glorify God? And secondly... To glorify God is to live your life in light of this truth. To live in a way that demonstrates that you actually believe what you're saying. So see, the first thing you must do is to know Him. You must seek to know who God is and see all His greatness in the Word of God and through prayer and through His working in your life. But then, as you begin to see how, God, how great God is, you need to give your life more and more to Him. You need to live for Him. You say, well, I don't know how. Well, that's why we have the Bible. You see, the Bible is not just to teach you how to live. And the purpose of the Bible is not to teach you how to get your, the best life you, you possibly can. The Bible is to teach us how to glorify God, how we can do that. And I just want to look at uh, some things today that we're going to look at ways in which uh, we can glorify God, all right? That we can please God, that we can, that we can bless Him. Um, the first is, by, and, and this should come as no surprise, the first thing we can do, and the most important thing, the greatest of all commands, is we can honor God by loving God. Now, I want you to listen to what Jesus says in Mark chapter 12, verse 30. 
And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. With everything that you are, you should love God. Jesus said this was the greatest commandment. Do you realize that? I mean, of all the commandments, and there's a whole bunch of them, but of all of them, the greatest of all is that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, to love the Lord with all your heart and soul, it, it means to love Him um, from the very depths of, of your being. It, it's to love Him with everything that you are. You know, our heart in the Bible kind of represents the control center. It's like that one area of, of us that controls everything else. It controls our actions. It controls uh, our thoughts. It controls our emotions. Everything about us. And what it's basically saying is the control center of your life ought to be given over to God and that you ought to love God with the very deepest part of your heart. Now, let me tell you something. I have been, uh, I've been a Christian for a long time, and, uh, and, and this is the goal in my life. The life. My goal is not to be you know, a great missionary or a great preacher, um, a great speaker or something like that. My goal is to love God. Do you know, my goal is not even to know everything that can be known in the Bible. Um, my goal is to know things in the Bible so that I might love God. God, because that's the greatest thing. And also to love Him with all your mind. Now, children, um, when I tell my boys it's time to get up because they need to do math, uh, they just don't, I mean, they just don't jump out of bed and say, oh, great, we, we get to do math today. But, um, but in a sense, they should. And I, I teach them that. Not because they, they love math necessarily, but because they love God. That by obeying um, their parents, by, uh, by studying sciences and mathematics and literature and everything, they can use those things in God's service. So they study math because they love God, because they love Him, and maybe one day they'll use their math in order to serve God. So, it, you know, when, you, when you're at school or when you're homeschooled, you need to realize something. You see, this, this truth right here, it affects everything. Why do we obey our parents? Uh, why do we want to be kind to our friends? Why do we want to tell people about Jesus? And why do we want to uh, do math? Uh, because we love God. It pleases God. And we want to prepare ourselves to be great servants of God. So we should love Him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and with all our strength. Um, young guys, uh, there's nothing wrong with being strong. And, uh, you know, when you run, you run for God. Uh, if your dad has you in some kind of sports where maybe you're playing baseball or basketball or football or, or wrestling or, or things like that, you use your strength for the glory of God. Not for the glory of yourself, but for the glory of God. And that's another thing, boys and girls. I want you to understand something that's very, very important. The body is not the most important thing, but it is important. Do you know that you should, uh, you should eat um, correctly, properly. You should eat good food. Why? Because you love God and you want your body to exist as long as it can, as healthy as it can, so that you can serve God. You see that? Everything for Him. Even, even your muscles. Everything for God. And we should love Him with everything that He's given us. Um, this is the greatest of all commands. Now, if you learn all sorts of things about God and you've learned all kinds of principles and wisdom and you dress right and you talk right and you act right, but you do not love God, you have nothing. Absolutely nothing. So what is our goal in all the things that we're doing? It's to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. Now, let's go to another one. 
we can uh, glorify God by giving him reverence, respect, and honor. Um, I like to laugh a lot. And um, I like to listen to, to funny stories and funny jokes and all sorts of things. And even sometimes in my, in my prayer life, I think about how go good God is, how beautiful He is, and, and I'll even laugh or just be so happy because of the things that God has done, you know. And, um, but I want you to know something. Uh, when it comes to my relationship with God, even when I'm happy, um, even when I'm full of joy, I, I still realize this is God. This is the one who made me. This is the one who's greater than the entire universe combined. This is the one who deserves my respect. He does deserve my respect. You know, Jesus taught us a great way to look at, at our relationship with God, the Father. In, the, in what's called the Lord's Prayer, or better, the model prayer in Matthew 6. And this is what he said. He began the prayer by this, Our Father. If you believe in Jesus Christ, God is your Father. And He is a wonderful Father. And you can run to Him. You can talk to Him. You can even laugh with Him. I mean, sometimes, I, I tell you what, I, I have a good time, as you probably know, I like going out in the woods and hiking and all kinds of things. And I mean, I love to talk to God about the things I see. Like, God, why did you make tadpoles the way you made them? You know, Or look at the veins on a leaf and just sit there and laugh at just how brilliant and, and how powerful God is. Um, funny things that may happen to me and say, Lord, I know that you, uh, you are over everything and somehow I think... Uh, you caused this to happen to me today, and it is so funny. So I have a good time with the Lord. He is my Father. But Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven. Even though He is my Father, and I am His child, and I can love and laugh and rejoice with Him, I need to remember always that my Father is the God of heaven. He's the King of kings, and He is the Lord of of lords and he deserves my greatest respect. In my home we do not allow anyone to talk about God or to talk about Jesus in a funny way. Never, 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 never. I could not I do not want to disrespect the one who made me and gives me every beat of my heart. I do not want to disrespect the one who sent his son to die for me. You see, the reason, one of the reasons why um, we follow Jesus Christ is, is because of loyalty. Look what he did. So we honor him and we respect him and we hold his name to be very, very dear. Do not use the name of God in a funny or silly way. Don't ever tell jokes about God or, or laugh about the things of God. You can laugh with God, but never at God. You can laugh about maybe the way that you have fallen and failed or the silly things that you might do just because you don't have wisdom. But when you talk about God, even though there's a smile on your face and you're happy in the Lord, you do so with respect. Okay. Now the Bible says, Now Israel... What does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways and love Him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, to fear the Lord. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means fear. It really does. And you say, well, I, how can I love God and fear God? And if God is good, why should I fear Him? I want you to imagine, um, wow, how can I share this? I mean, this is, this is really difficult. God is good, and He does love you, and He's better and kinder than you will ever know. But when we talk about God, we're talking about someone so different, so powerful, um, 
so sovereign, that means he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that all the nations combined are nothing but a tiny drop of water in a bucket or like a speck of dust on a balance. He holds the world together just by his word. He holds your life in the palm of his hand. Um, he is just so great that if we were to see him as he is, it would cause us to tremble. Not because he's not good, not because he's not kind, but because he is so great and he is the ruler of all things, and we should respect Him. Love Him, rejoice in Him, but respect Him. Now, he says, fear the Lord your God to walk in all His ways. One of the ways in which we show that we respect God is to walk in His ways and not walk in our own ways. You have to make a decision, child, every day of your life, every moment of your life. Am I going to walk in my way or am I going to walk in God's way? Who do I believe? Who am I going to obey? Myself, others, or God? So how do we respect God? By walking in His ways, by loving Him, and by serving Him. You know, children, I've got I to gotta let you in on a secret. Um, I pray for the children that are going to listen to this, and I pray that they will become servants of God. Yes, I, I'm praying that you will become a servant of God and that you will become a slave of Christ, that you will live to do whatever He tells you to do. Now, um, that's a good thing. Now, why is it a good thing? Well, I'll tell you. Um, the happiest man in the world is the one who makes himself a slave to a perfect master. And our master, the Lord Jesus Christ, is absolutely perfect. Do you know... I've served him for, wow, I don't know. I don't even know what the number is. I know it's over 25 and I know that it's less than 30 years. But you know, he never failed me one time. There's never been one time that I regretted serving Christ. But there has been many times that I have regretted uh, not serving him or not giving him my all. He's kind. He's never failed me. He's gentle. He takes care of me. And that's a neat thing. You know, when, when we say Jesus is Lord and we're his servants, do you know what that means? It means the only thing that we have to care about is doing what he tells us. And he has to care about everything else. If I'm the slave of Jesus Christ, the servant of Jesus, then he has to make sure that I'm fed and clothed and protected. And uh, all I have to care about is doing what he tells me. Is his kingdom, his will. And you see, it's a good thing to be a servant of Christ. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, if you meet me in probably 40 more years, if I live that long, I'll still be saying the same thing. Because no one has ever been able to accuse Jesus of any wrongdoing. Every person who has truly served him at the end of their life, their only sadness in their heart was that they did not serve him more. Okay? All right. So we need to respect the Lord and we do that by serving him. And it says with, with your heart and with all your soul. Here again, he's saying with everything that you are, you need to serve God. And that's how we show that we fear him, that we respect him. Now, it also says in 1 Samuel 2.30, this is a great verse to memorize for a young boy or girl. It's a wonderful verse. It's those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. If you will honor God, if you'll set out with your life from an early age to honor God, God will honor you. Uh, and you say, well, how do I honor Him? Well, first of all, loving Him. Second, doing what He says. Also, you need to understand this, children. Um, uh, we honor God well, let me put it this way. Uh, we are commanded, the first and great command is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second command is to love our neighbor as ourself. Now, if we do not love our neighbor, we do not love God. Because First John says, if you don't love your brother who you can see, how can you say you love God who you don't see? All right? 
So here's a, a neat thing you need to understand. It's impossible to honor God if you do not honor your parents. Okay? Yeah, I know it's a lot easier to honor God than it is your mom and dad. Because you live with your mom and dad. But if you want to honor God, honor your mom and honor your dad. All right? Now, there's a great blessing in this. Man, can you imagine? You're hearing this and some of you are like six years old. If you would just learn this now, if you would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you would learn, listen, this is going to be the, the story of my life. I am going to be a man who honors God. You know, there's some kids and they go up and they, I want to be the greatest basketball player when I grow up, or I want to be the greatest baseball player, or the greatest this or the greatest that. Why don't you seek to be a man or a woman who honors God? God will honor you. All right, let's go on. We can also glorify God by giving Him our worship and our praise. Yeah. Worship and praise. Let's listen to uh, Psalms 95.6. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. You know, um, men have a tendency to want to honor other men. It's just like an idol. It's idolatry. Well, we shouldn't have anything to do with that. We shouldn't be bowing down to other men or putting other men in the place of God. But there is one before whom we should bow. And that is the one true God who made us and sustains us and sent His Son to save us. We ought to live a life of worship. We ought to. Now, children, you know when you go to church, you sing songs, and that's good. That's called corporate worship. That means you're worshiping with other people as one united body. Okay? You need to do that. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you worship God by yourself? Maybe you've never even thought of that. You know, sometimes do you go to church and the worship doesn't seem that good? It's kind of boring? Well, here's the problem. It's really hard if a bunch of people get together to worship as a group, but they don't worship God as individuals. So what you need to do is this. You need to start thinking, man, I need to worship God for His glory and my benefit to worship Him. As, you're, as you learn new things about God, even in this this little teaching that we're doing here, as you learn new things about God, you just need to run into your bedroom, get down on your knees and worship Him. When I tell you that God is beautiful and I show you in Scripture how wonderful He is, you, you could even tell your mom, Mom, pause the film for a moment. I'm going to run into my room and I'm going to worship God. You say, well, how do I do that, Brother Paul? I, I Get down on your knees and start just thanking God for everything that He's done for you. Starts telling him how wonderful he is. Just talk to him with a, with a heart full of, of thanksgiving and gratitude. Just thank him for everything. My little girl Rowan, she will start praying. She's three years old and it is so funny because she'll say, Thank you God for this day. Thank you for mom and dad and Ian and Evan. And then, oh my, then it's thank you for my shoes and my socks. And thank you for the cricket I found today outside. And then, you know, I go to sleep before she gets finished. Well, just thank God for everything. And then just tell Him how much He means to you. All right? It says also, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, you may be thinking, well, I'm, a, I'm pretty young. Should I praise the Lord? Does God really want to hear me praising the Lord? Because I'm just a little kid. Well, uh, can you breathe? Do you breathe? If you breathe, He has commanded you to worship Him. And you need to do that. And not only for His glory, but you need to do it for you. And you say, well, how does that help me? When I worship God, it seems like I have a new strength and a new joy about me. When I worship God, it seems like all the big problems I thought I had, they start becoming very, 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 very small. Because the more I worship Him, I begin to think of how great He is. And in, in, compared to Him, every problem in my life is, is just really, really small. 
You see, when you look at all the things going on in your life and you think, man, these problems, they're like giants. Yeah, but when you look at God and see how big He is, all those giants begin to look like tiny little grasshoppers. So the more you worship God, the more you will have joy. The more you will walk in confidence. The more you will be able to stand against the bad things that you should not be doing. So let's live a life of worship. Live a life of worship. Now, we can also glorify God, and I've already talked about this, but we'll just read some verses about it, by living with thanksgiving and gratitude. By, by thanking God for everything. And, and we have some verses here. It says, I will give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Do you see here? We see thankfulness and glorifying God put together. So one of the ways in which we glorify God is by thanking Him for everything. Psalms 105.1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the peoples. Now, here's something very, very important. Um, you can tell other people about your God by the attitude of thanksgiving that you have. If you're a person who's just always walking around and you're sad and you don't see any good in anything and you just think that your life isn't that good, and yet at the same time you say you believe in God, well, people are going to look at that and say, well, what kind of God do you believe in? Because you're just sad and grumpy all the time and you never see anything good. But if, if, if you come to understand how good God is and the good things He's done for you, and you live a life of thanksgiving, and you're praising God and thanking Him, then other people are going to say, well, who is this God? Who is this God? Because I'd like to get to know Him. If He's such a blessing to you, and He's caused you to live a life of such gratitude and thanksgiving, I'd like to know Him. Now, uh, children, let, let me just tell you something, and I, I don't talk about this often uh, because it can be useful, but you have to be careful. Do you realize that um, you are rich? Um, even if you live in a poor area of town in, in, in the West, in America, and even if maybe you, your dad, like me, drives a, a beat-up old car, and, uh, and you don't have a bunch of fancy things like a lot of people, you still need to understand, child, you are rich. We work here at HeartCry. We work with people all over the world, and especially in a place called the Third World. And the Third World is a place where there is a, a lot of poverty, a lot of poor children. I have worked with children that were starving, dying because there was no doctor. Uh, had no place to live, living on the streets um, with parents who just did not even care. They didn't even know who their parents were. Um, they had no clean water. They hadn't bathed in, well, in months. And what I want you to see, I don't want to try to make you feel sad, but I, I want you to realize something. Sometimes we don't know how good we have it. That... Um, if we have food to eat, and we have clothing, and we have shelter, and we have parents that aren't perfect, but they genuinely love us, we are blessed more than probably, well, almost more than everybody else in the world. And I want you to see that. I want you to learn to look at all kinds of things and, um, and thank God for them. Um, sometimes I'll sit down um, with my children, and I'll ask them, uh, do you think that I, I'm a good dad? And they'll say, yes, Daddy, we think you're a good dad. Okay. Now, I'm not a perfect dad, but do you think I'm a good one? And they say, yes. And I say, well, what are some of the reasons? Well, you're, you're around with us, you play with us, you teach us the Bible, you love Mommy, and on and on. And then I tell them, are you thankful for that? Because before your dad came to know Jesus, your dad was a very bad man who did a lot of bad things. And the only reason 
that I'm sitting here today and I'm loving your mama and uh, I'm loving you and I'm teaching you the Bible and we play and do things. The only reason that's happening is because Jesus Christ saved me and is changing me. Now, are, do you thank Jesus for that? Because if there's any good in your father, it didn't come from him. It came from Jesus. And you need to thank him. Children, every good and perfect gift comes from God. So we ought to be thanking him. You know, um, every beat of your heart comes from him. You should thank him. Every breath from him, you should thank him. All the beautiful days and the, everything that's good in your life comes from Him. And, and, and it is a sin to not recognize all the goodness that God's done. It is. It's a sin. And um, so we ought to uh, turn away from our sin of always being grouchy and unsatisfied. And we need to develop an attitude of thanksgiving before God. Even, even for math, uh, my youngest son, Evan, he doesn't like math at all. And sometimes he, he can get pretty grumpy with regard to the math. And, uh, and I tell him you ought to be thankful because there are some children that will never have the opportunity to study these things and advance in their life because of them. So be thankful for everything, even math. All right, let's go on to the, the next one. We can uh, glorify God by believing Him, by trusting Him. You know, if, if I tell you something and you don't believe me, um, you don't trust me, um, that means you don't think very much of me. Well, if we don't believe God, it means that, well, we're not thinking very much of Him. And God is not like a man. We believe men even though men are capable of lying. God is not capable of lying. We believe men, even though they can fail in their promises, even when their promises are sincere, they can fail. But God has never failed in any of His promises. If we should believe anybody, uh, we should believe God because He's never lied and never failed. It says in Psalms 9.10, And those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Now look at this, children. This is very important. It says, those who know your name will put their trust in you. If you want to learn how to trust God more, then what you need to do is learn more about God. Because the more you learn about Him, about all the different things that He is, that He's righteous and He's holy and He's good and He's all-powerful, the more you learn those things, the more you will be able to put your trust in Him. Okay? That's a wonderful thing. Now, in Proverbs 3, 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Children, you've got to make a decision, remember? You trust in God and God's wisdom or you trust in you and your wisdom and um, I don't want to make you feel bad, but you do not have as much wisdom as you think you do. Um... Even now that I'm older, sometimes I think almost everything that I think is wrong. And that's why I must depend upon God and depend upon His wisdom. Now, it says here, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't trust Him one moment and doubt Him the next moment. Trust in Him. And if you say, well, Brother Paul, I still doubt, then do like the man did in the Gospels and say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, teach me to trust You. Show me. And, and remember this, faith comes by hearing the Word of Christ, by hearing the Gospel, by, hear, by listening to the Bible, by reading the Bible. You know, I trust God a lot more now than I did when I first began. And it's not because I've become better, but it's because um, I see Him in a better way. I know more of Him. I've seen Him be faithful every day of my life, and I know that He's trustworthy. Okay? Now, I know this has been a long session, but we're going to just do one more, okay? And it's, we can glorify God by obeying God. 
You know, if you say that you obey God, but you don't do what he says, then, then, uh, then you don't. I mean, if you, if you say, I love God, I glorify God, I sing about God, and you don't obey God, then you're not really telling the truth. Or you've tricked yourself. Or you've become what the Bible calls a hypocrite. Someone who has two faces. Who with one face says, I love God. And with the other face does not obey God. Now we don't want to be that way. We want to be sincere. We want to be true. And so if we're going to glorify God. If we're going to really serve Him. Then we must obey Him. And obeying Him, if you're a Christian... If God has changed your heart, obeying Him is not a sad thing to do. As a matter of fact, children, if you find that you always do not want to obey God and you always want to go your own way, then there's a good possibility that you do not know God yet. That you are not Christian yet. Because one of the evidences that we truly believe in Jesus Christ is that we begin to want more and more to do what He says. It doesn't mean we're perfect, and it doesn't mean that we always want to do what He says. It's a struggle. But we do see a change, and we begin to want to do what God wants us to do. Um, in Deuteronomy 27.10, it says this, You shall therefore obey the Lord your God and do His commandments and His statutes, which I command you today. Here we just see how important obedience is to obey God, to do what He actually says, not just talk about it. Like if, you're, if your mom or dad sends you to clean your room and after an hour they walk in and the, the room is not clean and they say, well, I told you to clean your room. And you say, well, Dad, I'm thinking about it. He, he says, I didn't tell you to think about it. I told you to do it. Well, if we're going to be obedient, we must be more than, we must do more than just think about it. Or do more than just want to be obedient. To be obedient, you must obey. Now, in 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Now, what does this mean? Um, God wants us not to be difficult people or complex people, very complicated people. Uh, God wants us to be simple people who simply believe and obey. There's a song that I remember when I was a kid they always sang in church and uh, we sing it today still. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We must trust in Him and we must obey Him. If we really do trust Him, we will obey what He says because we know it is best for us. Now, you can go to church every Sunday and every Wednesday. Uh, you can... Uh, sing as loud as anyone, anyone else in the church when they're singing worship songs. You can tell everybody in the world how much you love God. But if you don't obey Him, none of that really matters. And that's what that verse is saying. Is that to obey God, to simply just do what He says, is better than all the religious things that you could ever do. Now, children, I, I want you to be careful here. Um, although those of us who are older and truly love the Lord, although we desire to be obedient in everything, and, and we are obedient in many things, um, we struggle with obedience. I don't want to tell you to do something without telling you that when I do that, it's difficult for me too. For example, if you really are trying to obey God, but you find at times that you're just not obeying, well, um, join my club. I'm the same way. I don't want you to think that, uh, that, that, that those of us who, who preach or those of us who have been walking with Jesus a long time 
don't have problems with obedience and we just obey all the time because that's not true. I want to obey all the time. And my life has, uh, well, I have grown in obedience, I think, over the years. But we all struggle with obedience. And when we do disobey, what should we do? We should confess our sins to God and ask Him to forgive us and believe that He has because His Word promises us forgiveness. Now, what does it mean to confess? Well, let's just talk about that for a minute. I'm going to teach you a Greek word, homologeo. Okay, so now you can go and impress all your friends. You know a Greek word, homologeo. And what does it mean? It means to confess. But kind of literally it means to confess the same thing, to say the same thing. And so when we confess our sins to God, it, it doesn't mean we just go before God and say, God, forgive me. No, to confess is to say the same thing that God says. God, let's say that you got very angry with your sister, okay? And God says to you, maybe through the Bible or through the Holy Spirit or maybe even through your mom and dad, they point out to you, look, you're angry with your sister and that's wrong. Okay? When you discover that you have sinned, that you have been angry with your sister, to confess your sin is to go to God and to agree with Him. God, I agree with you about what you're saying about me. You say that I am wrong because I am angry with my sister. I agree what you, what you are saying is true. I am wrong. Please forgive me. I have done wrong. Forgive me. And then ask him to help you not to do that again. Also, children, when you've got like a sin in your life that you're really struggling with, go to your mom and dad and say, could you give me some, some verses or teach me some things because I really struggle with this. And, uh, and parents, um, you need to study the Word, don't you? To be able to minister to them when they ask you questions like that. Alright, He deserves our obedience. James 1.22 But prove yourselves doers of the Word and not merely hearers who delude themselves, who trick themselves. And, and what it's saying again is, look, the Christian life is not complicated. As we said in that old song, trust and obey. You simply need to trust God because He's never failed anyone. And you simply need to do what He says. Not just think about it, not just talk about it, not just want to do it. You just need to do it, you see. Um, and the more you do God's will, uh, the more joy you will have, the more you will prosper in the things of God. But never forget, something that's very precious to me, is that when you fail to do God's will, that our relationship with God is not uh, based on our performance or our ability to do everything perfectly. We do not earn God's love by being able to do what he says. We don't, earn love's God, we don't earn God's love at all. We don't earn salvation at all. I'm sitting here today and I am a Christian and if I died, I would go to heaven not because of my obedience but because of the obedience of Jesus. I'm saved not because of what I've done but because of what Jesus has done for me. God's Son died on a cross for every act of disobedience I have ever committed. And I'm going to heaven because I trust that what He did there on that cross paid for my sins. And the resurrection proves that. You see, it's all Jesus. All Jesus. All Jesus. All Jesus. I would rather see you um, not perfect and trusting in Jesus Christ than for you to think that you are perfect and you do not need Him. Remember, it is all a gift. We trust in Christ. And if we do trust in Him, if we do see that He died for us, that is going to cause us to want to be 
more obedient. All right. Well, I talked a long time, didn't I? But I hope that you've learned some things. And uh, it's my prayer that God will prosper you in all things, in all things, according to His will. God bless you. Have a great day. Please visit our website at heartcrymissionary.com. There you will find information about the ministry, our purpose, beliefs and methodologies, and extensive information about the missionaries we are privileged to serve.